Hello and welcome to today's webinar presentation. My name is David Cash. I'm a member of the marketing team here at Mounts. I'm glad you've taken the time to join us today and I hope you find this presentation useful and informative as well. Now I've been with, uh, with Mounts for uh, nearly 16 years now and I've been in the torque industry for 20 years and I've seen a, a lot of different types of applications and so I hope uh, again that you find the information that we have here useful. Now if you have any questions at all during the presentation feel free to type them in the chat at the end of the presentation we're going to review those questions and so uh, if anything sparks your interest please go ahead and fill out uh, the chat box with your questions. So let's go ahead and jump into today's presentation that we're looking at uh, implementing error proofing and workflow automation with the use of battery operated screwdrivers. And so as we take a look at this topic, it really helps us to be able to um, have the process optimization um, within the assembly. And what are some of the things that we can look at with that? So um, we're looking at uh, things that we can control during the assembly process. So any type of variable that uh, is related to the, um, the assembly process, uh, how can we implement er error proofing systems to the, uh, the entire process to help us eliminate any type of fastening errors. And so uh, what, what types of fastening errors are there? Well, the, the most common um, errors that we typically see are going to be improper torque control uh, so you may have fasteners that are under tightened um, or even over tightened. And in both situations, that's not very good for the application. Uh, under tightened fasteners can typically vibrate loose and you'll have failure. Um, but uh, sometimes the over torque is even worse because any type of uh, shock or uh, any type of vibration to that particular joint can uh, cause the fastener to break. Uh, if the fastener itself has been pushed to the yield point. Um, and so we can see that typically with over tightening fasteners as well. Uh, we can also uh, have cross threading types of issues for very fine threaded fasteners. And uh, we may also see uh, lifted fasteners or fasteners that haven't been fully tightened by the operator. And so these are some of the um, kind of errors that, uh, that we may see. And so uh, that's going to bring us to today's uh, poll question. Um, so let's go ahead and review uh, that question. Um, so how frequently are you experiencing fastening failures in your manufacturing process? And so uh, is that something that happens daily for you, uh, weekly, monthly, quarter year, quarterly, or too often uh, happens um, during uh, particular shifts? And so uh, we'll go ahead and let those answers go and as soon as we get uh, done with that we'll go ahead and move on with the presentation so So we go ahead and end um, our poll there. Uh, thanks so much for participating in that. Uh, it looks like our uh, results, uh, the top getter was weekly, uh, followed by uh, daily and quarterly, uh, tying in uh, second and third, respectively. Uh, so uh, that is uh, good news um, for uh, that we have a solution that we can help you with some of those manufacturing um uh, errors that we see with the fastening. And so that kind of leads us to the error proofing uh, process and how we can use our tools to help uh, do the error proofing uh, within the assembly. And so uh, if the error proofing itself uh, comes from the Japanese manufacturing process, uh, pokeyoke, uh, which means to mistake proof. Um, so it's basically we're providing behaviors uh, to the operator that allow them the opportunity not to make a mistake. Um, and <clears throat> in uh, this scenario, say uh, we have two fasteners for a application. Uh, they, I, the fasteners themselves are identical. The only difference is the length. So um, the, the, the operator may be using the same tool 
uh, set at the same torque value um, and uh, has the same bit that they're using. The only difference, uh, again, is the length. And so how can we um, error proof this particular uh, process to make sure that the operator is using the uh, correct fastener in the correct location? Um, and so this can be done uh, a couple different ways. If we take a look at uh, simply uh, tools that are going to be monitoring the torque, uh, when we run the fastener down, we are going to be signaled that the, the torque is complete. Now with the use of the uh, different uh, tools that we're uh, gonna be talking about today, within our uh, DC tool lineup and uh, in our battery system uh, today. We can also measure the amount of angle or turn uh, rotation that happens during the fastening process. So in this case, uh, as we run the fastener down, we can monitor the amount of turn that happens within the fastener. And so if we have a fastener that takes two revolutions to run down, that's 720 degrees of, uh, of angle. Um, or turn. Uh, so if we put into place a, a, a window that says that we must be between a minimum and a maximum amount of turn for a specific fastener, we have now kind of uh, eliminated the possibility of using the wrong fastener in the wrong location, or excuse me, in the right location. So we can guarantee that not only are we meeting the right torque, but we've also met the right amount of turn or angle within that particular fastener. So we can uh, rest assured that if the operator uh, gets a good signal from the tool that we've met not only the torque but the angle, then we would uh, be successful with that operation. If there was an error uh, that was dealt, or excuse me, that um, told us that the angle was not met, then the operator knows that they have failed and they need to use the right fastener for that particular operation. So that's how we can use um, just a few of the uh, uh, items that we have within the DC tools that um, allow us to error-proof the situation. And so uh, when we look at when would be a good time to look at um, using a, a fastening automation workflow, um, and by workflow, we mean um, with the automation process that the tool handles all of the communication that goes on, uh, can automatically change presets of the tool. Uh, we're not meaning um, automation in the fact that it's a robotic type of application, but uh, we're just automating the process. So when should we look at that? And so if we have a scenario where we need to maybe increase production, um, if you have the the situation where you maybe have a lot of different workstations that uh, are doing the same type of fastening operations within the use of one part, and we can consolidate those uh, into maybe a one workstation with a tool that has multiple different presets that we can use throughout the, the process, then we can help to reduce um, not only the tool cost, but uh, workstation cost. Um, operators can be freed up to do other types of work. Um, so you have that uh, capability within the process to be able to look at um, how we can benefit from the use of these types of tools uh, within your process. So um, the workflow uh, total um, error proofing process would, would encompass um, all of these factors. So we would ensure uh, proper torque control with being able to monitor not only the torque but the angle. We also have some special uh, functions within the tool that allow us to help uh, eliminate any type of uh, some of the common fasting errors that we see. Uh, we get to implement the total process control within the assembly process. So again, we're providing the operator with work instructions with the ability to uh, provide them uh, with the tool automatically changing after certain uh, rundowns. Uh, and then we can also do monitoring of the torque values that are um, coming from the tool. So we can link those specific values that we are seeing with the data to a specific part uh, that can be done through our real-time monitoring uh, functionality. And then we also have the ability to um, add all of this into uh, additional line communication processes through communication with a PLC 
uh, could be other line uh, control devices as well, light trees, uh, pneumatic locks, um, and other types of I.O. devices. So all of that included, we do have that, uh, that ability to use uh, for the entire process. And so if we take a look at the, uh, the battery tools themselves, we have two configurations of this style of tool. So uh, we have a pistol grip tool, tool and a right angle tool. Um, the torque ranges for these uh, start at a, just under eight inch pounds or so, and we can go all the way up to about 450 inch pounds uh, within certain models of each style of tool. Um, each tool has 15 different presets that we can use. So in essence, there's 15 different uh, torque settings, uh, 15 different tool settings, or uh, in the example that we brought up earlier, you could have 15 different fastening, uh, fastener uh, profiles within the tool. There's also the ability to have a multi-sequence. Uh, we have two of those, a multi-sequence A and a multi-sequence B. And what that means is we can take uh, the number of presets and we can stack them on top of each other and we can use that in one rundown event and uh, that can be very useful if you're dealing with a gasket type of application where you may see some initial relaxation after the first rundown so we could run uh, the fastener down at one preset pull it back up then run it back down to a different preset pull it back up run it back down uh, to another preset uh, and then Final, do a final torque of just turn uh, with another preset. So uh, there are uh, some functionalities that we can do um, with the, uh, the tools themselves and the different presets uh, that we have. Now, um, the, uh, these tools, uh, again, do provide uh, the torque control process where we can uh, monitor the torque uh, and monitor the angle. So we can tell the system uh, we want to look for a specific torque value and we must have a certain amount of turn uh, or we can do the reverse of that so we can simply just turn uh, the fastener to a certain number of degrees and monitor the torque um, as well and one question that we often get uh, with the battery style tools um, because they do come with a controller as well uh, is can these tools be used standalone without the use of a controller? And the answer is uh, yes, it can, but it depends on what you want to um, achieve with the outcome of what you're looking for. And so the, the tools themselves can be used, uh, again, standalone. And let's go ahead and take a look at um, the tools themselves, the display and how that works. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump in to that. So here I've got uh, the uh, right angle tool and the display. The, same, uh, the, the display is the same for the pistol grip style tool. The only difference is going to be the function keys um, that you see here below. And let me just make one adjustment here. And so um, on the display here, you can see in the upper left is going to be the Wi-Fi signal strength um, that uh, the tool has uh, in conjunction with whatever network it is connected to. Um, if the tools are being used uh, without a controller, um, you may not see this. Uh, we have which mode that we're in, currently in the operation mode. Uh, we have our battery life here. We have which preset we are using, what is the target for that preset. We have down below that our unit of measurement. Um, and then we have uh, information that happened during the last last rundown so we have the torque here um, over here when the tool is being used uh, this is going to show you what your rpm speed is uh, we have our total amount of angle uh, or turn right here and then um, in this case uh, on this bottom right this would be where we would have a count function if that was included in the uh, the programming of the tool uh, with the count so you could see where you are with the count and so if we want to um, again use this uh, by itself um, this would require the operator then to change the tool to a specific preset that they may want to use and so uh, if we do that uh, again these soft keys um, are connected to the windows that we see here so we can go up or down through the different presets and they'll kind of carousel around um, to the different um, presets 
if we use uh, that window. We can also take a look at the display. It's going to tell us information regarding the network settings that we have here. Um, and then we can also change uh, the mode if we like uh, from the high power mode to a low power uh, consumption mode. Um, <clears throat> so uh, all of these presets are available to be programmed um, directly from our PC uh, based software, um, our EP soft uh, software. Um, that software is included in the purchase of the tools themselves. There isn't uh, any type of licensing agreement um, or any type of seats that need to be purchased to run the, uh, the software uh, to be able to communicate with the tool. So that uh, is, is a, really, a really good savings uh, for you as well uh, compared to some of uh, the other uh, brands that we have uh, out on the market. Um, and so how do we, uh, again, go ahead and program that? Uh, each tool has a USB uh, device or a USB port on it. So we can plug directly from the PC to the tool and we can communicate that way. Uh, we can also do it wirelessly. So in each tool, there is a web server that is built into it. So we can go ahead and uh, put this tool onto a network we could have our PC on that same network and we can go ahead and communicate with the tool uh, that way. And so uh, that's kind of what I've done here. I have uh, one of our tools um, on the network here and I have it hooked up to um, the software wirelessly on the same network. And so we can come in and we can go to our fastening tab um, here and now we have uh, the ability to look at all uh, 15 different presets uh, that we have. So if we look at uh, say preset 15, uh, you can see what type of tightening we're doing, uh, which is our torque and angle uh, fastening. We have uh, our ability to enter in which torque value we would like. Uh, we can also take a look at the min and the max angle that we may have set up for a specific fastener. Um, and so we can do that with all 15 of the different presets. Um, in this case, you can see for preset one that I have it set for angle control. So it will turn um, 500 degrees and it will uh, go ahead and stop. So basically we're doing our angle control with torque monitoring. Um, so you can set up the different presets that way uh, without the use of the controller. Now there are some other functions that we can do in here. We can do some real-time uh, data collection. Uh, we could also do some graphing uh, functions where we can uh, go ahead and run the tool and it will provide us with the torque data uh, and graphing for a specific rundown. And so basically that's uh, what I'm doing here. We're monitoring two different channels. So we have our torque uh, channel and then we're angle. Uh, and so we can go ahead and we can save this information if we like uh, and we can review it uh, at another time. But you do have that ability to log directly into the tool if we place that tool on a specific network. So that's how we can um, basically use the tools uh, without them uh, being connected to the controller. Now you do lose um, the process control portion of the uh, the tools themselves uh, and then you lose some other functionality as well but if you don't need the controller then this is how you can uh, use it without it so so let's take a look at the controller then so the EPT or excuse me EPC 10 controller uh, is a 10 inch touchscreen display uh, it does have um, a number of ports on that so let's go ahead and take a look at that um, on the uh, one side we have a, a the micro SD card slot that we could use. There's the ethernet port. We also have three USB 2.0 ports and we have an HDMI out port. Uh, this uh, allows us to be able to mirror what's happening um, on this screen. We can send that out to a larger display that may be um, more advantageous for the operator to see. Uh, and you know, that'll make a little bit more sense here as we look at the actual uh, process control. Um, one of the USB ports is located on the top of the controller. And then on the bottom, we have our IO port, our RS-232 port, and the uh, power supply port. 
So the uh, entire process control um, that uh, that we're going to take a look at here uh, for this example, um, I've set it up uh, with a very rudimentary uh, type of, of process, but it's going to be where we're going to look at um, doing a two pass assembly uh, on this brushless DC motor. Uh, where we're going to be tightening down the housing bolts uh, at two different torque values. Uh, then we're also going to change tools to um, go ahead and tighten the remaining bolts, or excuse me, the fasteners for the, the cover. So what that looks like here um, in our demo process, let's go ahead and jump into that. So uh, right now, what I have is I have our controller here. I have uh, three different tools that are connected to the, the controller, and you can tell that by the orange uh, little tool icon that we have. There are a total number of four tools that are registered to this controller. Um, we can have up to eight tools connected to one controller at a time. Um, and there is a little bit of a, a, a caveat to that, depending on which mode that you're going to be using. Uh, the tool in, but nevertheless, we can talk about that here in just a, just a minute. Uh, right now, you can see that I have uh, this tool here, I have this tool here, and I have a, the right angle tool um, just off to the right. And all three of these tools are flashing um, with the status indicator uh, on the tool. And, and what that means is the tools are currently disabled. And so when we use the tools in the process control uh, mode or job mode, um, only the tool that is going to be a part of whatever process is being done at that particular time is going to be enabled. So this gives us the ability to make sure that the operator isn't using the wrong tool um, in the, that particular operation, but they are using the right tool because that is the only tool that has power. And so if we want to pull up the specific job that we're talking about with our, our uh, DC motor. Uh, I can come up here to open job and I can select from a, a job uh, within the menu. Um, we can have up to a thousand uh, different jobs with up to 255 steps uh, within that, but that would be um, very difficult to maybe uh, look at. So what we can do is we can assign a barcode to a specific job um, and that would allow us to be able uh, to pull up that job without much effort whatsoever. And so each tool that, um, that we have, uh, whether it be the right angle or the pistol grip style tool, um, they all come with a built-in barcode scanner. So if I just double click the trigger rapidly, you can see we have our barcode scanner. Um, and so we can go ahead and have that already within the tool uh, so we don't have to uh, waste time to go get or scan the barcode. And so I do have um, this barcode sheet here um, that has uh, different barcodes. So we have our program barcodes here. Um, over here we have our, uh, our product ID barcodes. Um, and so to pull up this particular program, I can just scan, scan the uh, barcode and the system will go ahead and pull up that particular job. So now in this case, we have instructions on the screen that are asking us to scan the product barcode. And so when I do this, this is actually going to integrate that particular product's uh, ID into the data collection records. So for every fasting uh, process that we do, that particular barcode will be uh, in that data set. So if there is ever a need to look at being able to uh, do some traceability or look at the time and the date that a certain uh, torquing application happened, what was that value, we can always come back and we can find that based off of the day, uh, the time, uh, and also by the product. And so um, we can't do anything with the tool. Um, it's still disabled uh, until we pass this step and we scan uh, the particular barcode. So now that we've scanned it, the system is telling us to go ahead and grab our pistol grip style tool. Uh, and um, now uh, you can see that the light is solid on this tool. This is the tool that we need to use. We're currently using uh, preset number one. And we have our fastening location that we need 
for our first pass um, on these uh, housing fasteners. So if I run the tool, uh, and in this case, I don't actually have the, uh, the motor here, but I have um, all of the, the settings to run to a certain angle uh, and then go ahead and shut off. So once we get a good fastening, we will go ahead and we can index to the next, uh, the next fastening location and so on as we make our way through the assembly we're being uh, or we're actually guiding the operator through if for example we are going to uh, do this rundown and we get an error you can see that the fastening location has turned red we still can't move on until we get a good fastening so the operator will need to reattempt that once we get a good fastening then it will index and we can move on. And so now uh, we're on our second pass. We've, uh, the tool has automatically changed to preset number two. Uh, and you can see that the color that we use for the target has changed. Um, I will show you what that, uh, how that works, but uh, you can select any color that you would like uh, depending on uh, the image that, that you want to use. And so um, if we go ahead and do the rundowns here for preset number two, and now we have done that uh, fastening um, application. We got a message that we're going to now be using the right angle tool. Uh, and now you can see that both of these tools are flashing, meaning that they are disabled. And so now we have uh, the uh, right angle tool um, for these last three fasteners. Uh, and so if I run this, now we've indexed to the next fastening location on side two and then we would then go to the fastener on the top of the housing and once we finish that we get a job okay signal uh, and then the system can reset and we can either at this point uh, we can disable the uh, the process to wait for the operator to scan another barcode for a specific uh, product or build that may come through or uh, we can have it repeat like it is um, here. And so what, the, what happens uh, or what the screen looks like during this process is we have the number of different steps that, that we look at uh, and it goes through different uh, steps. So at this point, um, we're looking at our first fastening here. Um, and if we go back to the image, you can see that this was where we started. Um, but this is kind of the graphical uh, rundown of what we're looking at. And we would move all the way through. And if we want to go back to the image at any time, uh, we can do that on the screen. And then we would run these next three fasteners. and so on. So that's how um, this, this uh, functionality um, may change or what you might see um, with or without the, the image. Now, um, as I mentioned, um, the system uh, itself is built up on uh, specific jobs that we created and um, that is done within the job manager. And if I wanna come in and edit this job, we can do that. Say we needed to change the fastening locations. So here is the uh, process for our first fastening. We have which tool we are using, the number of fasteners, and which preset we are using. And then we have the image that we are dealing with. And so out of these four fasteners, here are the different fastening locations, depending on which fastener we are using. So if we wanted to change fastener four, uh, to be over here with where fastener two is. We can do that and then we can come and select fastener two and we can move that over here. And so now we have changed uh, the order uh, without too much trouble. If we wanted to change the color, you could see that this is where it's done here. I can go ahead and select. Uh, and if we wanted to change that to a, a brownish color, we could do that. Um, so. If we want to see on the other side of the screen, we could do that. Or if we want to uh, hide this window, 
um, we could do that. So it makes it very easy to, oh, excuse me, makes it very easy for us to add the target data uh, to the application um, throughout the assembly. If we like what we have, we can go ahead and save that. And then we could go back out to our operation and we could start the process uh, again. Now, just to show you um, what uh, and how the tools function in a what would be our um, operation mode, um, this is where um, all of the tools are now enabled. The tools themselves are working independently of each other. Um, and as I use each different tool, the controller is capturing the torque data. And so if I go ahead and um, I get uh, an error on a location, you can see that we have um, indication by the uh, red uh, within that data set. Um, and we have our barcode uh, that we scanned. If I scan a different barcode, you can see now that it has uh, updated the barcode field. Maybe a little difficult to see on the uh, on the broadcast here, uh, but nevertheless, it has changed which um, barcode is now associated with the readings, and so that's how um, the tools can function um, independently of each other. Um, where the controller is now just gathering data from the tools, but it is not uh, engaged with the process control. Again, when we use the process control, only one tool of all of the tools that are connected um, will be able to be functioning um, with that. And so that's kind of the, uh, the difference that I wanted to, uh, to, to demonstrate. And so with that, that's going to bring us to uh, the question and answer segment. Uh, Chris, do we have any questions regarding our topic today? Uh, yeah, Dave, we have a few questions. Um, the first one was, how many fasting events or presets did you say can be programmed with each tool? So each tool can have um, up to 15 different presets uh, loaded onto it at one time. Um, in situations where you may need more than that, um, we have done um, some communications where we can actually save different uh, profiles. Uh, of different presets and those can be loaded on there to to make changes um, so each particular profile of the 15 different presets can be back um, backed up uh, and reloaded at any time I hope that makes sense all right thanks Dave uh, the next question was the data that is collected on each rundown is it stored directly on the tool or the EPC controller or both uh, it is um, stored on the controller. Um, the There is data that is stored on the tool, but it's really only um, basically cached. Uh, so if there is any type of communication error with the controller, uh, and then once a stat or information um, or the signal is reestablished, it will simply um, dump those particular readings into the system. Um, so... Uh, data can be stored directly onto the controller. It's not stored in the tool. Um, you can also stream the data out of the controller um, as well to an MES system. Um, so that is possible uh, as well. Um, so there is internal storage um, on the controller that can hold uh, uh, its eight gigabytes of uh, data internally. Uh, we can also add an external, or excuse me, add the micro SD card where we can expand it an additional 32 gigabytes. So you can store a lot of the data um, if you needed to just store it on the controller. All right, Dave, I guess a quick follow-up question on that was how much data can be stored on the tool? Uh, I don't know the exact amount of data. If, if you wanted to... Uh, use the tool without the controller um, you could uh, network it to the pc software and as that's being used you can use the real-time monitoring function to be able to pull uh, readings directly from the tool um, but in most cases um, it is done through the controller all right thanks dave and then a secondary follow-up question was uh, how to transfer data to MES, MES, 
can it be transferred directly to it, or does it need to have the PLC? Uh, it can be uh, directly transferred um, through the TCP IP, uh, and that would basically um, you'd need to uh, get with your IT uh, folks to be able to uh, integrate that into your system. But um, yeah, we each particular uh, function has its own address and so it can be either streamed out or it can be called on um, so you don't necessarily need to run it through a PLC all right thanks Dave uh, next question does the tool use a clutch or is there is the torque control by another method uh, so these tools um, are transducerized uh, tools. So there is an actual transducer inside of the, the DC tool, uh, and that is monitoring the torque. Um, so there is no clutch in these tools. All right. Uh, next question, Dave, is how much does the pistol grip and right angle tool weigh? Um, you could check our uh, website for that. Um I don't, uh, I don't know the exact weights um, per se, but I would 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 refer you to um, our website for that. Um, okay. So. Uh, next question, Dave, is can you use the tool to do a bit change, but still use the same process control feature? Uh, yes, you can um, use a uh, a different bit within within the process uh, for sure. You don't need um, you could just simply exchange out uh, whatever bit you might need uh, or socket depending on which style of tool uh, that you're using, um, and that can be uh, part of the instructions that uh, you can send to the operator uh, via a message um, to have them change the bit um, and then go ahead and. Um, do that all right thanks dave uh, this one's a two-part question uh one is what is the life of the battery and how many tightening rundowns can you do with every charge estimated so uh, it's going to uh depend on the uh, usage um that the battery is under as far as the amount of load we have done tests um, in a kind of a lab environment where we've been able to do um, up to 3,000 uh, fastenings on one particular charge, uh, but it it just depends on um, the level of torque that's being used for that particular uh, tool. Um, however, each tool is shipped with uh, two batteries. Um, in with the in conjunction with the uh, battery charger it only takes about 50 minutes for a fully depleted battery to be recharged um, so under one hour you can have uh, gone from a fully depleted state to fully charged uh, and so there's going to be plenty of uh, a time uh, to have a full battery uh, ready uh, when the next battery um, is depleted the system itself won't allow the tool to run unless it has enough battery to complete the operation. Um, so you will be uh, given a warning um, error about the battery uh, will need to be uh, will need to be changed. But we haven't seen um, any issues where uh, people need to change uh, the battery, um, and they're waiting for a specific charge uh, to happen. So. All right, Dave. Uh, last question is going to be, what communication protocols do we have available? Uh, so this um, runs on either a Modbus uh, or Open Protocol. Um, those two uh, systems uh, can communicate um, through the IOs or, or through the Ethernet um, on this particular uh, controller or the TCP IP. All right, Dave. That's the end of our questions. All right. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. If you have uh, any questions or you would like any more information on our battery uh, transducerized DC control systems, uh, feel free to reach out to um, our uh, sales team and they can certainly uh, help you with that. If you have any other additional questions, we'll be glad to reach out and get you those answers as well. All right. Thank you so much and have a great day.